suis Albert Albala, de D-Cycle, de la fondation euh, Linux. Je travaille avec, euh, je travaille avec TP1. Uh, oh, English, true, forgot. So uh, yeah, I worked with Linux Foundation. Uh, I did a couple of uh, big, small sites in Drupal, and I've been working especially with um, continuous integration and testing and, and that kind of thing, and which kind of led me to, uh, to Docker. So this presentation, if you want to, if you want to grab it on uh, GitHub, it's uh, it's on uh, it's on GitHub. The entire presentation and my blog is at DCycle Project. So. Basically, uh, well, there's just two of you, but maybe you can tell me, like, uh, who, like, wh what, what exactly you want to get out of this? Uh? For me, so um, I, I come from background of just DevOps area. Okay. Uh, so it's more on, uh, more on all the lines of like implementing continuous integration for clients. Uh, but what I have a hard time understanding is how we can make it so that it's easy for Drupal installations. Okay. Uh, in the perspective of like having multiple instances in a fleet of servers and then managing virtual machines for every single one of the Drupal okay. instances. Okay. Sounds good. I, I'm not sure I'll, can I'll be able to touch on exactly that kind of thing. The, my, the reason I'm, I like Docker is more for like uh, setting up throwaway uh, development accounts, but I'll, I'll touch on deployment a bit and you know, I'll see about that. So um, how, how about you? What's your uh, interest in... Uh, Okay. To manage deployments, cool. production environments, and we might have a project where we'll have to use Docker. You'll love it. <laughs> so, um, have you ever used Docker before, any of you? I have. Okay. So, um, we can make it more since we're like just three of us. Let's make it more of a discussion, and I can animate. And if you want to stop me anytime, uh, no problem. So we're going to look at why, you know, wh why DevOps. Uh, I'll just kind of go through that fast because I think both of you are, are already sold on that. And, you know, why, why containers and not m virtual machines? Like, you know, you don't need Docker to do containers, but it's, it's, it can be, uh, it is better uh, because of the caching, but we'll look at why the difference is. Um, we'll look at idempotence uh, versus just throwaway containers. I, I don't like idempotence. I think it's, it's a, the wrong solution to uh, bad design, and I'll tell you why. Uh, and look, look at how Docker uses caching and why that's interesting, and look at, after that, how data is uh, used in, um, in, in Docker containers, uh, one approach to data. Uh, we'll look at some demos. We're going we're gonna, to uh, deploy a live site uh, and do some automated, test th automated testing and things like that. Look at some caveats, uh, things to consider. And if you, if you guys have some que well, questions, you just do it like all, all uh, along the, the uh, presentation since we're just three of us. So why DevOps? So uh, at first, you know, we, we had you know, nothing under Git and uh, we were just FTPing into our servers, and after that, Drupal became under Git, but not the database. We were always cloning this this unversioned database every time we wanted to do something. And after that, now this is where most of us are now, some, some sort of a, like features-based thing with site deployment modules or, or, or a way to get features out of the database and into the code base. And the promise of DevOps is to move those last two parts into uh, under Git as well, so to have something where like everything's under Git. And, and that's kind of the, the, the where Docker comes in, is in that those last two parts. And perhaps Vagrant and Puppet and Ansible and all of other tools are, are, are in that space as well. And, and there's maybe some kind of competition going there. So, so that's like, uh, today I want to maybe explain why I think, in many cases, Docker can be really an interesting uh, alternative. So Really quickly, VMs and, and containers, just the way they, they work. I mean, uh, in th this is the way most of us are going to use VMs. We're going to have, let's say, a Mac OS, and we're going to have a Vagrant and, and um, what's it called, VirtualBox. And it, it's really, when you look at like, all the resources this stuff uses, there's a, there's a reason why it takes 35 seconds to one minute to launch uh, a VM. So basically, um, it, it's... it's duplicating a lot of the effort. All the libraries, all of the, all of the OS files, they're all like duplicated. Whereas the way Docker works, uh, the way containers work, and Docker is just a wrapper around containers. So the, the way c containers work is that your, your application is going to, application A, for example, is going to think it runs under Ubuntu. And application B is going to think it runs under CentOS. But your core OS is, but your host OS might be core OS or something else. And containers kind of manage all that kind of making 
sure that the, the applications think they're running in a specific environment, and, and, uh, but they're, they're actually reusing a lot of what's common between different OSs, right? So as you can see, that's a lot more nimble, and you'll see in a few minutes how, how extremely fast uh, that is. Uh, so that's the way containers work, and that, by the way, does not work on Mac or Windows. You have to have you have to have a, a Linux uh, box, for example, Ubuntu, or the one I love to use is CoreOS. CoreOS is like a very, very, very tiny OS that ships with Docker and Git, and and that's like the perfect OS. And I have it installed on a, on Vagrant on my Mac, so I never actually develop anything on my Mac. I always SSH into this CoreOS machine, which is on my Mac. I have a question. Yeah. So, like in, in a typical cloud-based Docker hosting company, and I'm thinking, for example, of IBM Bluemix, who's is about to launch their Docker hosting service. Mm -hmm. OS. Do you find that there might be a risk of having constraints on what you can do or cannot do because you won't have access to configure the, the core? I, I haven't come across any. I know that there's some discussion around that, but y when you log into these containers, you really are in your container. You really, you, you really, everything acts exactly as if you were at, uh, at the OS level. However, if you want to do some really fancy stuff at the kernel level, then you might not be able to. But in, in most cases I've seen, uh, that's not a problem. And it's maybe a good thing that uh, you don't have access to that. Is that like a, doc, is that a container in the service, or are they provisioning you an, a version of their OS with your own login where you can install Docker to play with your containers? It's like, uh, it's like a runtime, so you provide the, the host OS and you just deploy the actual containers. Okay. I, think think that's I, think, a I mean, we, we had a challenge with, not, not Bluemix, but from other providers, uh, from the clients hosting it. Um, what, what ends up happening is the, the OS that we were using had different packages and dependencies, and so when we had to push it to their production environment, packages are missing, so they had to deploy that. And one way to circumvent that is uh, like having the regular touch points on what is the baseline OS are we building on top of, and what are the, the packages that we're installing on top, and having that uh, in sync all the time, so that their system means no longer trying to do. But why do you have, why are you having packages on this, uh, on, on this system? Because the only thing you really need is, is Docker, right? On the on the base, and then everything else is in the containers. The, the way that our team worked was we were getting our hands dirty in there, so we had a lot of floating around tools just for debugging purposes and like log rotate and all that other fun stuff, which were okay. not at all at, like, they were all Docker 1.3, 1.4. Uh, okay. Because the way, what I would do is I would just have all of that stuff in another Docker container. You have like a Docker, uh, Docker debug container, or Docker development container, or Docker production. So all these containers are super cheap to set up and, and destroy, so uh, I wouldn't do anything on the, on the host OS. Actually, my usage of, like, I, I have nothing on my Mac, and I have nothing on core OS either. Everything, like, you, everything I do is in containers. containers. Yeah, and it works fine. Containers talk to each other. And so we'll move on with, uh, with data. So. In a, in a typical um, setup where you're using, you know, tools like Ansible and, and Puppet and Chef that, that, that are kind of idempotent. So idempotent, uh, the idea is that, like, you describe how something should be and then the, the kind of system makes it so. So, like, for example, Puppet is going to have this weird kind of ugly uh, um, uh, syntax here that's going to, like, make sure that PHP is 5.2, right? And to me, that, that to me is, like, that's clunky. It's, it's hard to understand. It's hard to get your head around. It's, you have to understand all these new languages. So I, I try to avoid idempotence entirely. I try to do all my workflow without idempotence. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. But the reason we need idempotence is because we can't just get rid of this machine, right? This machine contains data. So we can't just get rid of it and replace it with a new one. So we need to have a mechanism to, to go in and change little parts of it with what we want. And that's the idempotence. And that's how Puppet, and, uh, Puppet works and, and Chef and Ansible. Um, in the case of containers, containers are actually made to be throwaway. So you can just get rid of the container and replace it. So for example, in the case of Drupal, the data will be your, your database, of course, and the site's default files module. Those are the two things that are data in, in Drupal. So you don't want those things to be stored on the container. You want, to, to be, you want the container to have access to them, but you want them to actually be stored on somewhere else, probably on your host, uh, on your host, you can do it on your host OS. So you would run MySQL instance on within the, the, within the container? 
Yeah, a a all, the, all the application stuff is in a container. So the MySQL instance, the server, everything, is, is, it's all on the container. Just the database data itself is on the, is on the uh, host machine, but not any kind of application to deal with it. That's all on the, uh, that's all on the container side. So when you have something like this, you no longer need idempotence, right? You, you, idempotence becomes irrelevant because all you need to do when you want to update, let's say you want to update uh, memcache from a, for a point version, you want to update Drupal from 8.0.1 to 8.0.2 .0 .0 or whatever, all you need to do really is just get rid of your machine, destroy it, put in a new one, and link that new machine to your same data, run drush up DB, and, and you're set to go. So you don't need those, th these item potent tools uh, th that are just so kind of clunky and hard to understand. You don't need your team to understand these anymore to do DevOps. Um, so aggressive caching, you know, do Docker basically uh, is not going to do the same thing twice. If you launch a machine and it takes 30 seconds to launch in Docker, and you destroy it and you relaunch it after that, it's going to take less than a second because Docker keeps everything in cache and it kind of increment, like Git, it kind of incrementally uh, keeps in memory every state of the, of the container. So that's kind of nice. Um, and, and you have this kind of, to me, what I, what I find is a psychological uh, threshold uh, of, of instantaneity, instant, instantaneity, instantaneousness. Right. So, um, if something takes 30 seconds to launch a VM, it kind of feels slow. And, and developers are just not going to do it. You know, they're going to do it maybe twice an hour or whatever. And they're going to do a lot of development between times they, they relaunch their machine from scratch. So their, their machines get polluted with all stuff they might have tried and gotten rid of. And then tests are going to either fail or pass, but it might be because the machine is polluted. It's not necessarily because, because the test fails or passes. Because it's now instantaneous to, do, uh, to use Docker, uh, you can start a new several times a minute if you want. You can change something, restart your, like just rebuild from scratch every time. So you're not, you don't have a polluted interface. And uh, you can even do some of what Pantheon does. Pantheon actually is, is builds these machines from scratch every time a request comes in for a website page. So let's say I want the About Us page on some website. Type, I type it into my browser. It hits the Pantheon box. And at that second, Pantheon launches the container, serves up the page, and gets rid of the container. So these containers just become like very throwaway things. You never log into these containers. You, you, just, you just throw them out, replace them. What's important is your data, and what's important is the link between the two. So a few demos. Uh, name me a module, Drupal module. Uh, Drupal 7? Whatever, Drupal 8, 7. Views. Views, OK. <laughs> so I'm going to get views. Um, Drupal.org project views. So I'm going to get uh, the Drupal 7 version of views because there's no Drupal 8 version. And I'll show you how Docker, how you can use Docker actually to, um, to, to, to do development on views, right? Because don't forget, we're not, we, we no longer have MAMP on our machines now. MAMP is, is, is dépassé, right? So we're going to put in views in, our, uh, in, a, in a specified, this, this area demo here is a space that's shared between my Mac and my uh, CoreOS machine. So I'm going to develop there. So don't forget, I don't, have, I don't have Drupal, I don't have anything on this machine. I did, um, for, the, for uh, the purposes of using uh, Docker, I found kind of Docker hard to kind of get around. Like the, I'll just show you the interface really quickly of, of what Docker looks like when, you get, when you're on a CoreOS box. You can do something like Docker search Drupal. And it's going to give you a bunch of, of Docker images that you know, are supposed to work with Drupal. But it, there's, there's no documentation about this anywhere. It's really hard to, it's to find stuff that works. So I built a um, project that I call the Decycle Box. And um, I'll actually download that now. And I'll show you what it does. So. The Decycle box, what it is, it's a collection of, of uh, Docker scripts that I've found and I've created which actually work, that I can guarantee they work because first of all, I'm testing them to a large degree and second of all, I'm using them all the time. So if you, if you want to, to play around with Docker, Decycle box is a good place to start. So I'll, Decycle box contains this move to your project root and depending on the type of project you have, uh, in this case, it's Drupal 7 module, 
I'm going to go ahead and just copy all of this stuff to my uh, views here. Right? And I'm going to be able to develop views with Docker. And I'll show you how. So, um, this, is my, this is my core OS box, which is a Vagrant box. So I'm going to be moving into views. Docker PS allows me to see what my running containers are. I don't have any for now. So, Dcycle box, it, it's a collection of scripts, and I'm just going to run it now. Dcycle deploy. I'll give it a port number. In this case, 80. If you want to have different instances running, you can have one on 80, one on 81, whatever. In this case, I only have one, so I'll run it on the port 80. And I'm going to run my deployment script. There, it's done. So basically, it, what it did now is it provisioned uh, Drupal, uh, it dr provisioned, uh, I think it's an Ubuntu box. It put in MySQL, it, it made it put in Apache, it started all that stuff. It uh, built the Drupal site from scratch. It, it, put, it installed views on there and all of that stuff. So as you can see, it took one second or less. Because of its aggressive use of caching, this means that I've, I've done this before sometime in the past. I, I must have developed a Drupal 7 module maybe last week. And, and Docker remembers this, so it's not going to reinstall Apache. It, knows it, it already knows it has somewhere in its diffs that Apache was installed in such a way. So if I run Docker PS now, I see that I have one running container. It has a container hash, and uh, you can log into it. So I'm going to actually log into this container now. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, yeah. So this is the IP address of my Vagrant box. I'm going to reload that. And if we're lucky, it should work. So what, th what this script does is it, it inst instantiated the Drupal 7 uh, module, uh, Drupal 7 site, and it, allow, and it installed views on that. So I can start developing. Um, so I'm going to run another script I have on DCYCLEBOT, which is called ULI. And I'm going to pass it as an, an argument, 717, which is the first numbers of this hash here. You can put 7178 or whatever. And if it finds a unique match, it's going gonna, it's gonna to log into that container. And it's going to create a user, a user hash for you. So you can log into this. And you can really start you know, developing views, doing what you want with it. And when you're done, you just basically kill off that container. I'm going to docker kill 717. And that's it. That container's gone. So as you can see, every time we interact with Docker, it's basically instantaneous. So there, there's kind of no turning back. There's no going back to Vagrant and, and VirtualBox after this. You, you can't stand waiting 45 seconds for a box to spin up. You have it for, for free here. So another module, D, D8 module, maybe. Do you guys have a D8 module in mind? I haven't used D8. OK, I have one. I'll give you token. So I already downloaded token. And so I'll make sure I have no running containers. And what I did with token is I copied and pasted this uh, move to your project root Drupal 8 module uh, stuff from dcyclebox into token. And I can run that now, the same thing. I'll run the, uh, the script. Um, oops, that's not there. Let me just reload. This happens once in a while. I have to reload the vagrant uh, box. OK, well, while that happens, let's see if it's quick or not. Oh, no, it's because it actually is empty. OK, I'll just, I'll just re-download the whole thing. So token Drupal 8, um, or maybe token Drupal is better. There you go. And I'll get the Drupal 8 version of token. And I'm going to move it here. So this is the out of this is the out of the box token. Let me just see if my vagrant box reloaded. And what I need to do now is actually move in um, my copy to Drupal 8 module stuff to the token module. I just so if you want to develop stuff for Drupal 8 really quickly. Very easy. You just do, do it this way. You don't need to install MAMP and all this crap on your computer. So I'm going to head back to my Vagrant instance. And I just want to show you something, uh, something interesting. So if I go to share demo, um, yeah. And so if I go to token, 
So I'll run the, uh, the deploy script for token. So same thing, done. It just installed a, a Drupal 8 site on, uh, on I think it's, a, it's Ubuntu. Um, so now I have access to. Sorry, so that script also did the same thing. It, it created an instance of Drupal and then it installed token on that. Yeah, not just Drupal, but the whole the whole stack. So in this case, it's using SQLite, I believe. It's it's just installing it's everything you need to to actually use uh, Drupal. Yeah, exactly. I'll get that to that in a sec. Good point. So this is a D8 site, actually. So I just want to show you something really quickly. This is, um, if you look at now, if I go to Docker PS, uh, Docker PS, I'll see that I have one container running on port 80. I'm going to head back to views now, and I'm going to run deploy um, on port 81, for example. And now, at this point, I'm going to have two containers, one running on port 80 and one port 81. And they're actually two completely different servers. Um, so here's my views development environment on port 81, and here's my token development environment on port 80. And in fact, they're, they're completely different. So you can I can actually log into these containers. Uh, let's say if I log into the first one, and I run a command to get the version of Drush, for example. Mm. Oh, 839. Just stop me if you don't get uh, what I'm doing. And if I do the exact same thing on the other container, so it tells me that I'm using Drush version 5.10 with my Drupal 7 site, because presumably this is the version I want to be using for my Drupal 7 site. But on Drupal 8, I, used to, I like to have the development version of Drush. So if I go 489 on the container 489, if I run the exact same command, I get Drush 7.0. Dash dev. So I can have all these different kind of environments with different versions of all kinds of software, MySQL and PHP and Apache running in parallel and just get rid of them when I want to. So uh, that's it for the uh, site uh, development, uh, uh, the module development uh, demo. Uh, get rid of these. Yeah. Okay. So how about, if, uh, how about for other stuff? How about for non-Drupal sites? Well, it's the same thing. I mean, I like uh, Jekyll uh, a lot. Actually, this, um, this uh, presentation is written in Jekyll. And Jekyll, you kind of need to have a Jekyll server, and you need to have a Nginx server. It's quite a complex setup to set this up. GitHub gives it to you for free, but you know, with Docker, it no longer matters if stuff is complex, because it's just so cheap to set these up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my presentation, which is what we're looking at now. And I'm going to run the exact same script, which was meant for, for Jekyll. And I'm going to put that on port, let's say, 999. Because I want to develop that on port 999. And see, so it's, it's actually building two separate uh, containers. So if I, look, if I do a Docker PS now, I'm going to have, I'm going to have four containers running. I'm going to have two, two that are serving up my Jekyll site, one that's actually building the Jekyll site. I have an Nginx one that's on Ubuntu that's actually serving it up. I have my D7 on uh, CentOS and I have my D8 on Ubuntu all containers. And because these are actually sharing a lot of resources, it's really, really cheap to have these running, which is kind of nice. So if I go to, um, if I go here and type 999, I'm going to be on my presentation because it just set that cluster of uh, VMs up. Um, how about a Drupal site? Well, a Drupal site is interesting because there's, there's a few things that, are, that you need to do on a Drupal site. First of all, the data is different whether you're developing or whether you're um, deploying to production. I'll explain why. If you're developing a Drupal site and you have a, a module that you're working on, you want, you want this module to be persistent even if your container disappears. Whereas you don't care about the database. You, don't, you, know, you, you can get rid of the database and get a, new for, get a new version of it quite easily. Sorry. Whereas when you're in production, what's important to be persistent is the site's default files and the database. So it's kind of different in both situations. 
so from, for uh, sites, what I did in uh, DCYCLEBOX was I have um, set up uh, two ways of two two kind of uh, two two ways of setting this up. One with making the actual files persistent in the config management, and the other using the uh, using the uh, the database and uh, sites default files. So I'm going to just head over to my <coughs> I'm going to get rid of all of these containers because I don't need them anymore. Uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so I have one container left. I'm going to kill that. There, gone. So I'm going to go back to my demo, and I have a Drupal 8 site. Now, if you guys want to take a look at this, it's actually quite easy to do. Um, if you go to the cycle box, uh, if you look, if you go to the Decycle Box website, which is box.decycle.com, let me just see if I can, if I have it here somewhere. No. So right here you have uh, to get a feel for how this might be used uh, on a D8 project. You can click there, and you have a, a GitHub project that actually, with instructions on how to set it up. And what's great with this, is that you can actually set this up directly on a CoreOS machine. Uh, in the cloud, so uh, that's actually <laughs> that's actually what I did. Uh, I'm gonna just log into DigitalOcean here. Mm. So I have this uh, this box called uh, demo with today's date, and I can actually log into that. And this is actually a D8 site that I built from scratch, which is not very nice because I'm not a designer. But, uh, you know, it's, it's still, it's set up. And, and the reason I put the, the, a picture there and I put a, a node there is because I want that information to be persistent when I get rid of the box. And I'll show you how, how that can uh, be done. I'm going to log into that box. Um, uh, I'm going to SSH into that external box. So I created this box. Oops. Get, uh. Okay. Now I'm in my my box. So this is this is basically what you have on the uh, the GitHub account. Um, so if I look at what my Docker containers are on this remote DigitalOcean uh, instance, well, I have one Docker container. I created it two hours ago, and it's running what's presumably important live data, right? So these kittens, and, and this is stuff I want to keep, right? So, but the box itself, if you remember correctly, and this is really one of the main ideas of, of, um, of Docker, the box itself is a throwaway. We don't care about the box, because we can rebuild it in one second whenever we want. The data we care about, so we need to separate those, and that's what I did on this machine. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this box, I'm going to kill it, Yeah, exactly. In fact, anything I, I want to, to that I find is important on my on my CoreOS container, I need to I need to specify in my CoreOS files that I, these need to be on my host. So, I'll I'll just get, I'll I'll show you really quickly what these uh, files actually uh, look like. So, in the case of my Drupal eight site, I have two Docker files. This is really the heart of Docker. So there, there's not much to it, actually. I'm, I'm just starting from a, a Docker container that I know that works. Right? You can start from anything. And the ad, what, what ad says is that I want to take what's on my, what's on my, on my um, host machine and add it to my container, and I don't want them to be synced. So in the case of my production site, all of my modules, all of my themes, I want these to reside on my container because I know that on my production instance of, of Docker, I'm never going to be actually changing anything on my, at my modules. I'm going to be doing this on dev. So I don't care if they're added and then they're not synced. And it's a lot faster. However, there's another, um, another way to add stuff, which is the uh, V argument, which I'll show you. So in the case of production, when I'm Docker running, this is the command that's interesting here. 
when I'm running a, an image, a Docker image, to create a container, I want to actually synchronize stuff between data, dash project name, whatever, dash files, on my local system, and SRV Drupal WW sites default files on my host system. I want these to be synchronized at all times. And I also want um, the DB to be synchronized with the host. So if I, if I go back to my, well, I'm going to actually delete this. I'm going to kill this, um, this container. Oops, docker kill e4d. So now if I, if I log back into a doc, if I log back in here, it's going to tell me there's nothing because that container's gone. But the data remains. Why does the data remain? The data remains because I told it I wanted to synchronize it with, with my host system. So if I log back onto Docker, onto uh, CoreOS now, and I go to data, I see that this file system, uh, oops. What did I do? Oh yeah, I wanted to CD into data. This contains my database and my files. What is my database? Well, I can, um, it's actually a, it's actually a SQLite database, okay. right? But you can also do this with a MySQL database. Uh, and my file is my site's default file. So all of that stuff is, is safe on my host machine. So my containers, I can get rid of them whenever I want. And when I, when I, dis when I do decide that, um, when I do decide that I want to, to recreate this machine or perhaps an updated version of this machine, I could just recreate the machine. And if it's out of sync with the database, I just run drush up db on the machine. And there you go, right? So eProd just tells it I want to have a production environment and not a development environment. So now it's actually checking. Th I have a script that's ac that actually checks, OK, I want, to, I, I want to, re to, to rebuild a new container around this data. And so you see no database update required. Well, that means that this, the script is actually ch knows that the database might be out of sync. So it's checking if it needs to run Drush up DB or not. And it realizes it doesn't, so it's happy. And I can go about my business now and, and revisit the site. So the site's down for a few seconds when I do updates, and that's the only thing that happens. Um, back to the demos. Okay, I showed you how to do a, a, a develop, uh, deployment to production. So uh, right now I'm going to just head over to, um, I'm going to head back to my local CoreOS site. And I'm going to go to my Drupal site. I'm going to dock. I'm going to run my deploy script, but for development, right? Um, so now you see it's not doing a drush up DB. It's right. It's doing setup initial because I don't need a drush up DB. It's just setting up the initial site basically. Um, so it's doing all the kind of stuff that it needs to do to create this website from scratch, including in, in, if you're familiar with the configuration management system in D8, imports all the, like, si the, the basic theme and all the views and all that stuff. And we're going to see in a moment how I can actually go, go ahead, and, um, go ahead and, and, and do some development on this. So uh, I understood that you're, we're using uh, uh, the, co the host, the CoreOS host file system as your persistent data store yeah. for your files. Right. Uh, if you're not syncing, then say, for example, from the front end, uh, my user goes and uploads another file. Yeah. That file will be stored in, some, in, in files location somewhere in Drupal. Well, in dev, that's what happens. So if, if I'm developing this website and I, and I add temporary nodes and files and whatnot, as soon as I destroy this container, that those, files, those things are gone. Oh, that's right. In production, they're synced. They're always synced. So as soon as I upload a, a new node, my database gets updated. When I upload a new image, that image gets stored in the, uh, in the uh, file system, which is also synced. So, the, so they never get out of sync, okay. these things. So I now have a um, development environment, a D8 envelop development environment here, um, which is on my Docker, which is on my local Docker machine, uh, which is, I believe, here. And now 
I want to add, let's say, some sort of a, something to my website. For example, a vocabulary. So the first thing I need to do is, is go ahead and log into my machine. Oh, I need to give it a, uh, I need to give it the container name I want to log in as, 4B2. And this is, this is Drupal 8, so there's no more features or anything like that. I'm just going to log in. I'm going to change something about this site. You know, perhaps I don't actually, perhaps I don't actually like this theme that much. Maybe it's not, maybe it was a bad idea. So I, I might want to go and change that theme to something else. I'll maybe change it to uh, something minimalist. Uh, I'll actually change it to to this here. I'll, ch I'll change it to this. Set as default. Kind of ugly, but that's what I want. And if I go back home now, so this was this is the development I'm doing. I can also add views and vocabulary terms and whatnot. But this is the only thing I wanted to do for now. So once that's done, oops, mm -hmm. system reboot in five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so um, that threw me off. Uh, so basically now what I want to do is I'm going to, c I'm going to run another script called uh, export configs. Oh, I'll tell it which container, 4B2. And it's going to basically grab that new configuration. So you can see system theme up there. It's updated. So it knows that that stuff up there. So anything you do, basically, be it views, anything at all, this script grabs these and puts them in the, uh, the configuration uh, store which is, in the case of a dev environment, synchronized with my CoreOS machine. So if right now, if I head back to my Mac, and I do git status, so my system theme YML has changed, and if I do a git diff here, it's changed from Mayo to Classy. So that's, you know, that's, uh, that's cool. Um, do I actually want to set that on a master branch? I'm going to actually check it out on a new branch. I'll git commit that demo with different theme. Git push origin demo, right? Oops. There you go. Okay, so I'll head back to my, um, this is my production site, right? So, again, using Docker, I'm going to log into my production sites. This would actually be your continuous integration server doing this. It wouldn't be you, but for the case of the, for the, uh, for the, um, for the purposes of the demo, I'll do it myself. And this container here contains my old theme. I don't want to log into that and change the theme. I, I, don't, I don't care about this container anymore. So what I want to do now is I want to just delete the container. Right? And at this point, I'm going to be able to deploy my new container on port 80 with my production script. No database update required. If I had had a database updates, it would do them here. So if I'm, for example, up, up uh, grading modules or whatnot. It can do the database updates here. And at this point, when I log back into my, to my uh, remote core OS, I'm still logged in because don't forget, everything is the same. So the cookies, everything remains identical. Except, no, oh, didn't seem to. Well, it should have done it anyway. Live demos never work. You have to apply the configuration from your Yeah, it's supposed to do that automatically. I don't know why it didn't. Oh, well. But the idea is, um, the idea is, Oh, you know why? What, what, what did you say? Do we need to go from the front end and apply the... No, no, that should do that automatically. But the reason it's not working is I used the wrong branch. I should use the branch demo. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to git checkout demo. I'm going to git pull origin demo. Docker PS. So see here, I made a mistake. Well, I don't, it doesn't matter. I can just kill it. So it's, it's super cheap to create these uh, containers. Example. Yeah. So there was a good example. I'm just to recreate it. It takes a few seconds. And uh, now you can actually see it going through the update process where it, where it re-imports this new configuration. Because don't forget, you don't want to do anything in the in user interface, right? This is all your, con your continuous integration server doing this stuff. So you don't, can't log into your interface at all.
pretty expensive. Yeah. Nice. Cool. I'm not sure why this one is taking so long, because it's all in cash, so I, I don't know why that's... Maybe I did something wrong, but anyway. You have a noisy neighbor. Huh? You have a noisy neighbor in the digital ocean. Uh-huh. So there you have no database updates required, but you will see it probably... Yeah, you see there, system theme update? That's what it's doing. So... And there, the new container is done using the old data, and I can now log back into this thing, and I'm going to have whatever changes I made. In this case, it's just changing a theme, but it can be anything. And the important thing is using my old data also. So no item potence. You don't need to, to wrap your head around all this, this Ansible and Puppet and Chef stuff, which to me I find completely opaque and incomprehensible. You don't need that stuff. All you need is throwaway containers. That's the idea. That's what I love about, uh, about Dutch. Yeah. And installs a new PHP version in your production environment. Ah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, let's sure that okay, it was working on my machine, but now it's breaking. That's actually a really good point. So, your your Docker files, like really often, I'm I'm going to actually show you a Docker file that's that's more kind of representative of what a Docker file may look like. Uh, this, this is by the way, this is a Puppet file. You, you don't want to you want to get into that. It's 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 just too difficult. Um, so here's what a typical Docker file may look like, right? So in this case, uh, from basically the base box. So you can, you, there's lots of base boxes going around with, in this case, I decided to just start from Ubuntu, straight up Ubuntu. And I'm basically doing everything I need to do to set up a D8 site. So your question basically is when, when you go ahead and install, for example, curl or PHP 5 curl or or at some point I'm installing PHP 5, so on line 17 I'm installing PHP 5, for example. Um, at this point, the idea, what, what you're saying is, when you're developing locally, the PHP version of, uh, that, that, that kind of ships with Ubuntu on this package manager is PHP 5.2, for example, and when you do it in production, it's 5.3, and that's... It happens on the day you're going to play in production, that's, to that, that's a really good point, and, and what I'm... Yeah, so what I, what I try to do as much as possible is uh, to use a Docker hub. So t is to build these Docker files. Like, for example, this one, I built it. I gave it a version, and I throw it on the Docker hub. And that is never going to change. It's never going to be rebuilt. And then on my local um, Drupal 8 site here, my Docker file is actually using the image that's, that's actually the binary from the, dr the Docker Hub. So it's never rebuilding it. That, that's one way I'm getting around this problem. The other way I'm getting around this problem uh, is, is visible, for example, um, yeah, this is a good example here, line 36. So in this case, I'm actually, I don't want to just drush DL Drupal because drush DL Drupal doesn't tell me which version I'm using. I want to actually d download a specific version of Drupal and ideally, a specific version of PHP and any other th stuff I'm using. I just, so, so ideally you want to you kind of encapsulate the versions of what you're doing in there. And when beta 11 comes out, well, you just change beta 10 to beta 11 and, and you, 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 re you, you throw away your old server completely and you can recreate a new server from scratch, but with your new version of your, of your image. So that's something that could happen and that I've seen happen in the past that you have different versions and different builds of your Docker file. And those are the two kind of techniques that I decided to use to get around that, uh, that issue. Your image once, uh, always recreate, reuse that image until you know you have to upgrade it. Yeah, it. yeah. That, that was the kind of the idea. All the stuff is experimental, by the way, so I wouldn't go around using it in production, but it's kind of just a way to, to get a feel for the, for the technology and, and see how it could, you know, theoretically be used. Um, I probably would, but uh, being, at being aware that it's an experimental kind of thing, right? Uh, I, I, 
Probably would today, yeah, myself. Um, but we'd have to, you know, make sure that the stakeholders understand that it's, it's kind of a new technology and it's not used in production by a lot of people. But it has, it has advantages. So you, you, can, you can take the time you save by using its advantages and kind of use that time to make Docker better and more secure and so on. And, and I, I would probably do it for sure. Shopify, uh, yeah, Shopify uses Docker, and they blog about it and so on, yeah. So, last thing I want to show you is uh, CI. So, um, I'm going to head over. With Shopify, so they have a team of, I don't know how many hundred developers. Oh. So, if there's a problem, they have, yeah. then with the Well, you're going to have problems with Vagrant and with, uh, with Puppet and with Chef and with, uh, and with just with having some guy in a corner office uh, logging into the, to the production server and, and playing around. Whatever you do, you're going to have problems. I think Docker is in a position where it's kind of stable enough. Like, uh, I know a lot of startups that are actually making money from products, not from Docker. They're actually using Docker in production. And the common issues they run into is it's not Docker functioning, it's, but you know, some migration shift happened, configuration shift happened based on basic Right, yeah, and, and just everything is under version control, and it's just kind of, I, I, don't, I don't foresee any issue. There is the, uh, the um, kind of technical problem that Docker runs as root. So you could theoretically have different containers access each other. It's, it's a theoretical problem, and the guys at Core OS are working on an alternative to Docker called um, Rocket. Rocket. So... And Rocket actually runs under, di under different users and so on. It's a bit supposedly more secure. I don't understand the security concern myself. I maybe not. I, I just kind of don't get it. But I don't see how it's possible, but I apparently it is. So that's what I want to show you. is just uh, the... Um, so if you, if you were to it at the... Uh, at, if you were at the presentation about, um, about uh, Travis, yeah... You saw that they, they were using Travis. I don't use Travis because Circle uses Circle supports Docker and Travis does not. So I use Circle instead. And in this case, what I'm testing is it's the same idea, basically. I'm just testing. Um, my test is basically building my Docker files, making sure they work. So you can run this test on every commit. And when you log into Circle CI, actually, I have it here. I can see that, for example, my this thing is actually a success. And you can see what the what the uh, continuous integration server uh, did to run this. So, uh, for example, building my production site, you can actually see that, you know, it, it, grabbed, the, it grabbed the base image correctly, it managed to, to deploy Drupal and so on, and there's no errors. So, so you can quite easily integrate this with a continuous integration server without installing any software in a continuous integration server. So your development box, your production box, your CI box, your testing box, your stage box, the only software you need on these things is CoreOS, one piece of software. And the idea, and the idea basically is, um, this, is, this is the problem that we want to solve, actually. So we have all this stuff we want to move around, uh, and we have all kinds of different ways of moving it around, shipping and trains and so on. And it just becomes kind of a nightmare you know, if you, have, you have to install WordPress on Ubuntu and you have to install Jekyll on, on Windows. And it just becomes this whole nightmare, this whole matrix. And the idea of Docker is really to, to kind of do what the shipping industry did, was to kind of in invent this kind of container, really. It's, it's really like a shipping container. And you put all this stuff in the shipping container, and the, the, the people who are moving this stuff around don't need to know what's inside them. CoreOS doesn't need to know what's inside your containers. It manages containers. When you're inside a container, you don't need to know who's moving you around. You just know that you're inside a container and they're always the same. So that, that kind of level of abstraction is extremely powerful, right? So I'll just finish this. Um, uh, so that, that's it for my demos. Um, you know, Docker doesn't work on Mac or Windows. Okay, fine. But CoreOS is such a s tiny OS that you can just install it with Vagrant super easily. And it just works. So forget Mac or Windows, just work on core OS. Um, Docker runs under root, like I said, it's a security issue, but you have, you have Rocket being developed. And, and you know, this, this, it's a good idea to start working with Docker now, and when Ro Rocket comes out, probably switch then. So this is what it, stuff was like before Docker, and stuff is like often now. We, it's just a pain in the ass to put 
stuff on, on servers and use Puppet and, and Chef and all that stuff to manage these things. It's just really a big pain. And after 